Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. God, show up in our hearts and help us hear your word. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to Jesus, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, "Uh, I bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, "Uh, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to go try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've just been married, (laughs) and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. And the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and There's still room. And the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I have a lot of questions about this text. No, seriously, a lot of questions, and you're going to have to hear them. (laughs) Number one, what is wrong with this guy's friends? (laughs) Their excuses are so incredibly flimsy. I'm surprised there's not on the list, like I'm washing my hair, or the dog ate my invitation. The litany of terrible excuses establishes how ludicrous this scene is. Generosity met with disinterest, disinterest met with anger, anger met with hospitality, sort of, I guess, I don't know. What is wrong with this guy's friends? Number two, what is wrong with this guy? (laughs) And why does Jesus put a story before us with a master no one likes and an enslaved person who has to do his bidding? Am I okay with a story about a master and a slave? Can such a story be instructive for us today? Number three. Did the poor, the blind, the disabled get a chance to say, no, I'm good. Did they have a choice in the matter or were they compelled to come in? Did they have a choice in the matter or did a powerful person exercise that power to fill his house and eat the food he had made for his guests? And one more question. Why does the NRSV still use the word lame? That is a word I don't try to use in my everyday conversations about anyone. This needs to change. Number four. And the last question is perhaps the most important. The last question is this. Am I invited, Jesus? You say that none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. None of those who were invited will taste my dinner. Is that me, Jesus? Am I invited, Jesus? Is my invitation still good? Have I missed it? I have a lot of questions about this text. But that's how parables work, don't they? Parables provoke questions more than they provide answers. And I think most of us have missed this because we were saturated with parables in Sunday school, in sermons, and in seminary. We have heard these stories so much that we can finish them by rote. The parables don't surprise us anymore because we've heard them a million times. The parables don't shock us because we know how they end. The parables don't alarm us because we assume that their interpretation is simple, it's moralistic, it's straightforward, that any kid can understand it. The parables no longer form us because we have mistaken their questions as answers. 
When Jesus first told these parables, these little stories were alarming, they're shocking, surprising, they're more than a little weird. Parables are not simple fables. Parables are not stories with a tidy moral at the end. Parables are not greeting card bromides. Parables have a sharp edge. Parables shock and offend. Parables disrupt. Parables question us. Parables interrogate us. But still, I have a lot of questions about this text. It's a strange little story, especially if we try to force God to play one of the characters in this parable. Too often our knee-jerk hermeneutical assumption is that God must be the powerful party thrower. But why? Why wouldn't God be found with the poor and the disabled? Moreover, why must God be a character in this allegory at all? What if God is not present in this parable, at least not in this allegorical way? What if God is not in the parable so much as God is hovering above this parable? God is not the party host inviting people. After all, the God of Jesus and Luke does not only invite the wealthy and the powerful who can repay God's generosity. Luke's God, Luke's God invites the Pharisee and the sinner, the powerful and the tax collector, the widowed and the wealthy. Moreover, what kind of God has people refuse a divine invitation to an extravagant feast? God, my friends, is nothing like this forlorn party host. This man so desperate to make sure his party is not wasted, so desperate to make sure it's not wasted that he will even invite the poor and the disabled as a last cause, if only to fill his home and perhaps even that empty spot in his soul. If I'm honest, I don't really see God in this story. I see God exceeding this story, exceeding the truncated hospitality of the parable's protagonist, opening up the invite list far beyond the original Rolodex. Do you all know what that is? No? <laughs> uh, exploding our assumptions about who belongs at a table topped with sumptuous food in a room characterized by generous hospitality. If a rich man can be forced, forced to be generous, then how much more will a God whose very being is generosity be hospitable to us? I have a lot of questions about this text. There's that last note of condemnation, a note that really concerns me. The master said to the enslaved person, for I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. They rejected me, so I'm going to turn to others. They were too busy for me, so I will bring someone else in their place. I will shame them with the company I keep in my house. That doesn't sound like the God Luke's Jesus proclaims. That God, such a God, does not settle for the least. Luke's God seeks them out. Such a God does not turn to the wealthy first. Luke's God places those who lack closest to all that they will ever need. So what in the world is this parable doing to us? But what if this parable is not just mere allegory? What if it's an alarming picture of the fragility of the powerful amongst us? God is not like this master but if even this master can be compelled to look high and low for guests, then God, the God of abundance and grace and love, the God of lost coins and lost sheep and lost siblings, then that God will stop at nothing to draw us to a table set for you and for me and for all people. I have a lot of questions about this text. One question I don't have is God's invitation for you and for me. God searches for us in the wide places and the narrow places. 
the near places and the far places, the bright places and the gloomy places, the happy places and the sad places. God searches for you. God invites you to a bountiful table. God's hands are wide open. And there is but one question before us. Will we hear that invitation? Will we heed that invitation? Will we be so distracted by the cares of this world that we miss when God invites us? Even worse, will we be so enamored with the world as it is, rather than the world as it should be? Will we be so seduced by the logics of power echoed from places of privilege? Will we be so lulled by hopelessness and fear that when God invites us, we will find any excuse to avoid the table that God has placed before us. But good news, friends. Even if we miss it, the invitation is not rescinded. God is no bitter host. God will not move down to the next person on God's Facebook list. God's list has already looked in the wide places and the narrow places God is not picky about invitations. No, God is an eternal host, ever inviting, ever loving, ever graceful, and ever ready to welcome us back home. The invitation is open. The invitation will never close. God is looking for you everywhere in the wide places, and in the narrow places. And God's eyes are not just looking for you, but for those to your left and to your right, for those you see and those you don't see, for those you expect to see at the Lord's table, and those whose presence will cause you to question every bit of theology you have ever held dear. The invitation is open. The invitation will never close. Accept that invitation and delight in those God has searched for in the wide places and the narrow places. Delight in those God has gathered to your left and to your right. Delight in those God has made your kin. For God's table is expansive and wide and there's always one more chair. I have a lot of questions about this text. Here's one more question to take with us. What might it feel like for you and for me in our ministries to look to the narrow places and the wide places? Not just when we are rejected, but as the very first move we make. What might that feel like? I think it would feel like the kingdom, and it might just taste like the kingdom too.